so I want to start with a word of prayer. Nice to meet you, Craig. God, God bless you too. God bless you too. So, so I want to start with a word of prayer this evening. Um, obviously, we can't talk about the Holy Spirit and not start with prayer, right? <laughs> and so we want to do that. So, so does anybody have a, a prayer request, uh, something or someone for whom you'd like us to pray? Yeah, Miriam. We prayed for him before, right? Is that? The, I, I thought so. Yeah, Aiden. Oh my word, that's so rough on a twelve-year-old. All right, Aiden, Aiden, yeah, Monica. Okay. All right, let's pray for Monica's mom. Anybody else have a prayer request? Yeah, Maroon. Yeah, Vicky had that on Sunday. She could barely talk on Sunday. Yeah. And obviously, let's pray. Uh, I think it's on everybody's mind, too. Let's pray for the whole coronavirus situation and, you know, pray for God just to stop it, which we know he can. Um, so, so you're going to be getting, everybody should be getting an email from us tomorrow that we're sending out just kind of uh, precautionary, let you know the steps that we're taking as a church and all of that kind of stuff. So, yeah, but at the end of the day, part of our message is twofold. God, God's sovereign, so, so there's nothing that happens that God's not in control of. And, and, and at the end, we're going to talk about the fact, don't be fearful, all right? Uh, Paul said God hadn't given us the spirit of fear, right? So, so we're going to trust God in the midst of all of it, no matter what happens. And obviously, we're hoping and praying that it just kind of, you know, after a couple of weeks, just kind of fades away. But at the same time, we're going to trust God. So, yeah. So, so let me give you a couple of prayer requests. So Linda Elton, Tim Elton's wife, is in uh, Memorial West Hospital with chest pains tonight. So it's the second time she's had chest pains in the last month. I think they even had a stress test scheduled for like next week or something. And uh, Tim took her back in tonight with chest pains. And so she's seen a cardiologist tomorrow. So pray for her. Uh, Rosa Greer is recovering from a stroke. Rosa's at home, so pray for Rosa. Donna, is, Donna Anderson's recovering from back surgery. So uh, let's pray for Donna. And there was one more. Um, can't remember um and also i'd ask you to pray for my brother bruce so uh bruce and i kind of take turns with heart issues just a little bit and uh so bruce um a couple weeks ago had some chest pain went in they found two blockages they put three stents in and uh, sent him home he was home for three days and went back in the hospital with stomach pain they diagnosed him with pancreatitis and he was in the hospital for three days sent him home and we thought he was doing better, but uh, he called me about 3 o'clock today, and I said, how you doing? He said, I'm not doing any better. He said, we're still having pain. So he is coming right now. Actually, he should be showing up at the house about now. And tomorrow morning, he's going to be at Cleveland Clinic for a second opinion. So, so pray for Bruce. I appreciate your prayers for him. Anybody else? Anybody else have a prayer request? Yes, Anya. All right, let's pray for David as he travels. Somebody that I see? What's that, Faye? All right, let's pray for Faye. Pray for Faye. Yeah, a lot going on. All right, let, let's pray together this evening. Father, we love you, and, and Father, thank you so much for the opportunity j just to come to you in prayer. The fact that we can confidently share our burdens, our requests, everything with you. Father, we thank you so much for that. And so, God, we give these requests to you. Um, Father, you, you've heard each and every one of them, and Lord, I, I don't even think I'm able to go back and repeat all of them, but, but Father, you, you know each and every one of these requests, and Lord, how I pray that you would um, supernaturally work in the hearts and lives of these people. Many of our requests are for people who are dealing with health issues tonight, and uh, Lord, we cry out to you as Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. And we ask that, that you would reach down and touch their bodies, Lord, from, from little Aiden, Lord, who's in the hospital, to, to Faye Carby, to, uh, to Donna, Lord, to Linda Elton right now. Lord, we just pray that you would touch each and every one of these folks. And Father, I pray you'd give them grace and peace. We pray for Rosa, Lord, as she's recovering um, from, uh, from a heart issue. We pray for Monica's mom. 
Father, we pray for her, Lord, as she's homesick, and Jackie, as she's homesick as well. So, God, we just give these, these people to you. Father, we do. We pray for our church. And, Lord, we not only pray for physical healing, but, God, how we pray for spiritual healing as well. And, God, we're asking you to do a work in our midst. Father, specifically, we're asking for revival. We're asking, Lord, that that uh, you would manifest yourself in a powerful way, Lord, by seeing lives changed, Lord, by seeing, uh, Lord, uh, genuine repentance from sin and people coming to you. And, Father, we pray that not just for us. We don't pray that selfishly, Lord. We pray that for South Florida. And, God, we pray that for, for the city of Hollywood. And so we pray not just for our church, but we pray for all of the churches in our community. And we pray that as the gospel goes forth, for the, Father, that we would see and experience life change. And then, Lord, we, we pray for tonight's class. Lord, as we tackle a, um, Lord, what some would consider a difficult subject, um, we, we, we pray for the Holy Spirit's guidance. Lord, thank you that we're not talking just about him tonight, but he's here with us this evening. And so, Holy Spirit of God, we welcome you. We're thankful, we're so thankful that you're here with us and you indwell within us. And we want to get to know you. We want to, we want to, we want to understand you. We want to have close fellowship with you, Lord, as Paul says. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to understand this truth this evening. Uh, bless our time together. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So let me just start with a question this evening. So, uh, when, 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 when you think of the Holy Spirit, what is the first thought that comes to your mind? All right, I'm not asking for necessarily a deep, profound theological answer, but when you think of the Holy Spirit, what's the first thought that comes to your mind? Somebody, somebody share, Rum? Friend. Friend. Oh, my word, I can't believe you bring that up. So that's going to be a main point of ours tonight. Shoot, you beat me to the punch already right there. Friend, I love that. Somebody else, when I, when I say Holy Spirit, what comes to your mind? Why doesn't he ever tell me that? I wish I wish he would tell me to get a sandwich. He never does. Huh. There you go. There you go. Yeah. So direction, guidance and direction. Yeah. Somebody else. Somebody else. When and I'm not asking I'm not even asking for you to be theologically correct. I'm just asking what comes to your mind when I say Holy Spirit? Well, the voice of God. Very good. Voice of God. Janet? Comforter. Excellent. Yeah. Jim? What's that? Helper. Yeah. Excellent. Boy, we could kind of, God's presence with us. Yeah. We could probably close right now because you guys have already taught my lesson. You've already done that. Yeah. So the, 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 those are all, all of them were good answers. So I asked that question for this reason because admittedly, there's a lot of confusion when it comes to the person of the Holy Spirit. And not only is there a lot of confusion, but there is a lot of fear at times when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Maybe not like a, um, a, um, a terror type fear, but, but fear in the sense of uncertainty, that, that we don't know how to act. We don't know how to respond. There's conflict. There, there's, there's misunderstanding when it comes to the Holy Spirit. And so all of those are, are things that cause this study and our understanding of him to be difficult. Uh, I want to begin just with a couple of quotes. And um, I didn't give these to you, so you just kind of you know, perk your hear, ears up and let me give you a couple of quotes. So John MacArthur said in a sermon preached on January 25th uh, uh, three years ago, he said this, There is no more maligned, no more misunderstood no more misrepresented, no more insulted, no more dishonored, and no more blasphemed member of the Trinity in our contemporary church culture than the Holy Spirit. Robert Morris in his book, The God I Never Knew, says this, 
our denomination, and this is actually pretty humorous, so listen to this, because this is kind of the uh, culture that I grew up in, all right? Robert Moore says this, our denominational leaders treated him, the Holy Spirit, a bit like a crazy uncle who shows up at Thanksgiving once every few years and horrifies everyone with his inappropriate behavior. You can't help being related to this uncle, but you hope that if you don't mention his name or send him a Christmas card, he'll stay away. (laughs) So that's Robert Morris in his book, The God I Never Knew, on page two. He also says this, he says, after more than 25 years of experience in ministry, I've seen firsthand that most Christians hold a distorted, inaccurate, or incomplete view of the third member of the Trinity. He said that in his book, The God I Never Knew. Francis Chan, in the book, The Forgotten God, says this in the very first chapter. And by the way, the name of his first chapter, I love it. His first chapter is, I've got Jesus, why do I need the Holy Spirit? That's his first chapter. But he says this, for some reason, we don't think we need the Holy Spirit. We don't expect the Holy Spirit to act. Or if we do, our expectations are often misguided or self-serving. And so those are, those are actually three pastors from, from different branches or even different denominations within evangelicalism. Some of them come from more of a charismatic tradition. Some come from more of a conservative tradition, such as John MacArthur and Francis would probably be right in the middle. But all of them are saying the same thing. All of them are saying that there's this, there's this misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit of God. And because there's this misunderstanding, we don't relate to him as we should. And so um, that's my reason for tackling the subject. And so I would sit back, first of all, and say, there is no way that we're going to exhaust the subject in the next four weeks. All right? So, uh, so, so don't think that this is going to be a seminary class on pneumatology, which is the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to exhaust it. There's no way we can exhaust it in the next four weeks. But I would admit this, and so let me get really personal with you today. So, so I have to confess that this class is maybe more for me than it is for you. Am I allowed to say that as a teacher? It's more for me than it is for you. So, 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 so here's what I'm saying. I know a lot about the Holy Spirit. I've taken Bible college classes. I've taken seminary classes. I've taken grad school level classes on the Holy Spirit, all right? I I know a lot about the Holy Spirit. One of the things that I'm struggling with in my life is I don't think I know the Holy Spirit on a personal level the way that I need to know him. Does that make sense? Can I be transparent with you today? And so uh, my reason, there is a reason. So generally when I teach something, it's generally something that I struggle through. So I don't know whether you know it or not, but my messages are therapeutic for me, all right? So so they're not just things that we sit back and think this would be good for our congregation. Many times they're things that that, that Brian's working through in his life or we're working through uh, as a staff. And so uh, that's kind of the reason why I want to tackle this the next couple of weeks. And so my goal is threefold. I think I put this in your notes. So the first is this, to gain a biblical understanding of the person and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. So, so let me begin saying this, the, that, that the authority on the Holy Spirit of God is the Word of God. And we're going to see over and over again that the Holy Spirit will never contradict the word of God. And and that happens. So 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 there's a there there's a lot that's going on in Christianity that 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 quite frankly in my opinion is very confusing in in, in regards to the Holy Spirit, all right? But the Holy Spirit will never contradict the word of God. All right, and so our first goal is to gain a biblical understanding. So quite frankly, what does that mean? What does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I'm not going to ask you, okay, so what is the feel, what are the feelings that you have, or even necessarily what are the experiences that you've had? 
all right? Because quite frankly, our, our theology, our knowledge needs to be based on something much stronger than experiences or feelings, all right? That's not saying we can't have them, but that can't be the basis of what we believe. So we want to gain a biblical understanding. But secondly, we want to develop a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Kind of what Rome mentioned, and, and we're going to get there tonight. So, so I don't want you to, to view the Holy Spirit as this impersonal part of the Trinity, somebody with whom you cannot have a relationship. I grew up in that world, that the Holy Spirit, to a certain degree, was someone to be feared, and uh, we put him in a box, and we sat back and said, okay, here's certain things we're going to allow you to do, but we're really not going to allow you to get out of your box, all right? And, and I have to confess for years, even though I, I believe with all of my heart that the Holy Spirit was God and is God, I can't say that I've had a relationship with him. There's always been a little bit of apprehension with him. And so part of our goal in this class the next four weeks is develop a personal relationship with him. And the third is even more practical, and it's this, for you to recognize your need to depend upon him. So, so if, if, if we walk away from here and you can't dot your theological eyes about the Holy Spirit and, and you can't quote all the verses and you can't recite back to me all the doctrinal points, but you walk away realizing that you desperately need him in your life and that you can't function without him, then we've accomplished what we want to accomplish in class. Now, hopefully we're going to accomplish all of it. And uh, we, we have a big task ahead of us. So as we begin the study, there's two obstacles that we got to st- overcome to begin with, all right? It, you might sit back and say, Brian, I've already overcome those obstacles, but let me address the two obstacles. The first is this, and if you say you completely understand this, then you don't understand it, all right? The first is this, it's the mystery of the Trinity. So in order for us to understand the Holy Spirit, we've got to kind of overcome this obstacle of what is the Trinity. Let's be honest. The Trinity is mysterious, is it not? Um, it, it, it It is almost... And when I say it, I probably should say they, all right? So the, they, are, the, they are very difficult to define their relationship together. And there's several reasons why the doctrine of the Trinity is difficult or hard to grasp. And so I'll give them to you. I think I left you some, some, some place in your notes. At any point, if you want to pipe in, you know, lift your hand and we'll pipe in, okay? The first is this, is that the term Trinity never appears in the Bible, you might think it does, but never one time does the Bible name the Trinity. So, so, so there's not a verse that says, and the Trinity is made up of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The word Trinity is not in the Bible one time. Now, that doesn't mean the concept is not there, the truth is not there, but the word is not there. And so because the word is not there, sometimes we struggle with that. The, the second thing that I would mention, and this is a little humorous to me, but um, is... It makes it difficult to grasp by, by our use of, of human illustrations. So, so all of us have probably heard some of these illustrations before, all right? The Holy Spirit of God is like an egg. Just as an egg has a, 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 a yolk, a shell, and the white part of the egg, so the Holy Spirit of God. There's only one egg, but there's three parts to the egg. And so just as the egg has three parts, so the Holy Spirit of God are three people. You maybe heard that before. Well, the Holy Spirit is like water, all right? So water is what? It's ice, liquid, and steam. Or the Holy Spirit is like a shamrock, all right? It's one leaf. But there's three different parts of the leaf. You guys heard those illustrations before? I read one this week that I was trying to find out. It, it actually made me chuckle in this book on the Trinity because the guy said that the Holy Spirit is like a slab of bacon. And, and I'm sitting back thinking, boy, I like that illustration. I just try, I'm trying to figure out how it fits into the Holy Spirit. But, but what I'm saying is because we can't grasp it, because it's something that's outside our ability to grasp, sometimes it makes an understanding of the Holy Spirit a little bit more difficult. Here's another reason why this is the, the, uh, the Trinity's in ministry is because we at times try to define it by saying what it's not. So we'll say that the Father is not the Son, or, or the, 
the Holy Spirit is not the Father. We try to define it that way. Or we'll even say, let me throw out just a big word and, and we can define all of these. We'll sit back and say it's not modalism. Because some, sometimes, so, so in the history of the church, the church has tried to define the Trinity in so many different ways. And, and one of the ways in history that they tried to define it was a way called modalism. That they would sit back and say, well, there's really just one God who just manifests himself a different way. So, so, so at one point he has the hat of God the Father. And then he takes the hat of God the Father off. And he puts the hat of God the Son on. And then he takes the hat of God the Son on. And he puts the hat of God the Holy Spirit on. That's called modalism. All right, and and that's not what the Trinity is. And so, what I'm saying is, we've tried to define it, and because we can't exactly define it, it's mysterious for us. And 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 so, the fact that the Holy Spirit is mysterious kind of at times makes us uh, makes it difficult to understand the Holy Spirit. I gave you one of the early church creeds in your notes. It's the Athanasian Creed, which is one of the early church creeds, where the early church said this, we worship one God in Trinity, and the Trinity in unity, neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. That's a great, that was written hundreds and hundreds of years ago, but that's a great definition of the Trinity. One God who is completely unified, and yet even though they're completely unified, their personhood or their essence are not blended together. They're distinct, yet they're one. So do you understand that? No, you don't, because I don't understand it either. So don't look at me and say, you understand it. It's a mystery. We have to accept it by faith. And so it makes it difficult. What's that, Mary? (laughs) <laughs> so so here's the second reason. I can give you a couple of verses, and for time's sake, I'm not going to read all of these verses, but Matthew 13, 16, these are verses in which the Trinity is found. So one of the very first evidences of the Trinity is the baptism of Jesus, where, where Jesus is being baptized. You know, John the Baptist is baptizing Jesus. So here's God the Son, and while Jesus is being baptized, God the Father shouts out from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and the Holy Spirit is present in the form of a dove and so even though the word trinity is not mentioned we see trinity evidence throughout the New Testament so here's the second obstacle that we have to face and we've already alluded to it it's the misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit as we've already said, without a doubt, the most unknown, misinterpreted, and feared member of the Trinity is the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Let me give you just a couple of reasons, okay? And we might flesh these out the next couple of weeks. The first is this, and this is really important. He doesn't draw attention to himself, all right? His goal is not to draw attention to himself. What is the goal of the Holy Spirit? The goal of the Holy Spirit is always to point people to Jesus. And so because he doesn't draw attention to himself, he always seems like the member of the Trinity who's in the background. He always seems like he's the member of the Trinity who is just almost like a John the Baptist type figure whose job is to point others to Jesus. So here's the way way he defined, or Jesus defined it in John 15, 26. So Jesus says this, But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, notice what Jesus says, he will bear witness of me. And so Jesus is sitting back saying that that one of the goals of the Holy Spirit is not to draw attention to himself, but rather to lift up Jesus Christ. And so because he doesn't draw attention to himself, at times we view him as this obscure member of the Trinity and he doesn't have the prominence that Jesus has. In John 16, 14, Jesus speaking to the Holy Spirit says this, He will glorify me, all right? For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so the first reason why the Holy Spirit is misunderstood is because he doesn't magnify himself. He's not talking about himself. He's, uh, he, he, he's pointing people to Jesus. So, so, so here's the second reason. The second reason is that his gifts are misunderstood, and at times they're misused. 
The spiritual gifts are misunderstood and misused. So before you read into any judgment into that by what Brian is saying, let me read Paul's words on that, okay? So Paul said this in 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be misinformed, all right? Why did Paul write that? Because there was misinformation about spiritual gifts that was taking place in Corinth. There was what? There was misunderstanding. There was misuse. And so because of that misunderstanding and misuse, once again, we have this confusion. We have this fear. So, so many of you know my background. So I, so I came from an incredibly, I thank God for my heritage. You guys met my parents who were here for just a few weeks ago. I thank God for my heritage, but I come from an incredibly conservative background. Conservative in every sense of the word. So theologically conservative, practically conservative. Um, uh, um, so, so, so practically conservative. I grew up in a house in which, we, in which we never played playing cards at all. I mean, it was just wrong to own, never had playing cards. I never went to the movie theater. First time I ever went to the movie theater was when I was 25 years old, the very first time. And, and I went to the movie theater, and we went and saw this, and my mom was really upset that we went. So let me tell you the ungodly movie that we went to see that upset my mom. We went and saw Pocahontas at the movie theater, and my mom thought that we just committed like one of the most ungodly acts you've ever committed in your entire life. So I grew up incredibly conservative, but I also grew up incredibly conservative theologically. And so I say that, so, uh, so, so there was a fear, there was a paranoia of the Holy Spirit. So, so we saw some of the abuse that was taking place in other, in, other, uh, in other realms of evangelicalism. And rather than sitting back and investigating that and trying to come to a proper determination, here's what we did, we ran from it. We ran from it the other way. And so kind of like Robert Morris talked about in his book, he grew up in a similar background where we almost viewed the Holy Spirit as that uncle that you didn't want to show up at Christmas because you didn't know what he was going to do. And so you were scared to death that somebody was going to come in and do something in the service that you weren't uh, aware of or you couldn't control. And so there was a fear there. That's the way I grew up. That's the way I grew up, Bob. Mm -hmm. Um, I actually don't remember. I think it was interchangeable where I grew up. Yeah, but, 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 but even that's a great point because even the term Holy Ghost, even though that's what the Greek word means, but, but it kind of makes it fearful, right? So you're this little one and he talks about the Holy Ghost and you're like, ooh, I don't want to see the Holy Ghost, you know, or something. So that's a great point. That's a great point, Bob. Yeah, yeah. And so here's, a, here's the third misunderstanding about the Holy Spirit, and this I think is the most practical. All right? And the third is this. We don't think we need him. So, so kind of like Francis Chan's first chapter of his book, I got Jesus. Why do I need the Holy Spirit? And so because, and, and we would never verbalize that. God forbid we'd verbalize that. Because by verbalizing that, we would say verbalizing that would be blasphemous. But practically, that's what we think. So, so we sit back and think, I'm okay with God the Father, and I'm okay with God the Son. Let's kind of keep God the Holy Spirit in a closet because we're a little unsure about this guy. Let's keep him in the closet because I'm not sure we need him anyways. Now, that might sound extremely critical, but I'm just trying to be open and honest and transparent. And some of you come from the same background that I come from, so you know what I'm talking about when I say that. So, so today I just want to be, and we'll get theological in, in, in the weeks to come, but today I want to be really, really, really practical, okay? And I want to, I want to light a fire under you today. And, and, and this is, so, so these are two things that I want to share with you tonight that, that, that the Holy Spirit is really showing me about himself. So the first thing, overarching, and all, all this outline is going to blend together in the next couple of weeks, but the first thing I want you to see is this. The Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. Often because we call him a spirit, or as Bob says, because we call him a ghost, we fail to understand his personhood, all right? We tend to view him as a spiritual power that emanates from God, kind of like, and, and I certainly don't intend for this to be blasphemous at all, but we kind of view him a little bit 
like the force on the Star Wars movies. And we have a tendency to say, okay, may the force be with you. And we don't know what that means. We just know that there's this power that's available from God that is a lot like a force. And so we don't relate to the force. We're not sure exactly how to get it, but we know it's there. And we view the Holy Spirit more as a force than a person with whom we can relate and a person with whom we can communicate. So, so, so here's the question, and I kind of want to dive into this practically tonight. Who is the Holy Spirit? So, so when we talk about him, so whenever, whenever you want to meet somebody, so let's sit back and let's say you come to HCC and there's somebody over here that you see and you meet and they're with somebody you know, all right? So I, I don't know who it would be. So somebody popular. So you want to meet that person, and they're with somebody you know. Pro- many times the first step is to go up to that person who knows them and ask just a little bit about them. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Are you following me? Some of you look like me like I'm, I'm crazy, all right? Are you following me? <laughs> all right. All right. So, so I say all of that for this reason. So, so if we want to know about the Holy Spirit, it's probably best to go to someone who knows him the best. And there's no one who knows him like Jesus. And so what I want to do tonight is I want to spend some time in John chapters 14, 15, and 16. And, and rather than here's Paul's theology about the Holy Spirit, I want us to see tonight what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? Because he knows him better than anybody else, all right? So we're going to spend some time. So I want us to, to see some verses. So turn if you have your Bibles, and I hope you bring your Bible or your phone or whatever, or have the New Testament memorized, one of, the, one of, one of those. I'm not sure which one because we want to look at this tonight. So we're going to start in John chapter 14. Beginning in verse 15, John 14 and verse 15. So this is, this is Jesus' great discourse. He begins this chapter by, by talking about, don't let your hearts be troubled. I know I'm leaving. If you believe in God, you believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I wouldn't have told you. I go away, but don't worry, I'm coming again. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. That's this chapter, all right? And so you get down to verse 15, and Jesus has already told the disciples that he was leaving. And I think it's difficult for us to even imagine how that must have troubled the disciples. So, so they thought they were with Jesus all the time, all right? They were going to be with him. And Jesus had just told them I was going to leave, and so we, you can read the first part of the chapter. Verse 15, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Verse 16, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. So, so that word is so very important, all right? So that's Jesus' definition of the Holy Spirit. So does anybody have a different translation uh, in which that word is translated differently? What's it translated? Comforter, all right? Counselor, advocate. What, what, what translation are you reading? Which one is it? Do you remember? It's the Ron Milner translation, the, the New Living Translation. So, 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 so I say all of that, not to be funny or facetious, because, because all of those are great translations of the word, all right? They're wonderful translations of the word. Now, before I read that, I want to pull back, because I kind of got ahead of myself just a little bit. So, so in, in this discussion on the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16, it's important for us to realize the context and to understand to whom Jesus was talking. So he's not talking to a crowd of casual followers, all right? He isn't speaking to a group of religious leaders. So he hasn't assembled, you know, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees and said, let me talk to you about this. He's in a small room with his closest friends. So Jesus is in a small room, and in the upper room is what we know it as, with his closest friend, it's with his disciples. When he says this, he's less than 12 hours away from his death. So, so, so this is the night before he dies. This is a serious moment. So, so 
Whenever you gather your friends and family together and you know that you're not going to be around long, the last things you say are pretty important, right? So here's, here's Jesus realizing that he has a little time left with his disciples. And he begins to tell them, I'm leaving you, but I'm not going to leave you alone. All right, so here's what he says once again in verse 16. He says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. So that word helper, we've already seen it was translated um, advocate, it was translated counselor, it was translated, um, uh, what else, comforter. It had different words. So the Greek word is this, it's parakletos, okay, doesn't mean anything, I just did that so you guys know that I took one year of Greek and so, um, so, so I sound smart. So it means this, it means advocate, intercessor, counselor, comforter, helper. It's a word that's found five times in the New Testament. So here's what, Je- so the disciples are troubled, they don't know what in the world's going on, Jesus tells them, I'm leaving, but he says, don't worry. I'm not going to leave you alone. Here's who I'm going to send. I'm going to send the parakletos, the parakleton, to you, and he will be with you. Now think with me. Up to this point, Jesus had been the disciples' helper, right? If they had a question, who did they go to? Jesus. If they were in trouble, who did they go to? Jesus. They're out on the Sea of Galilee. The storm comes up. Jesus is down at the bottom of the boat. Who do they go to? Jesus. Jesus had been their helper up to this point. And Jesus sits back and realizes that he doesn't want to leave them alone. So he would send the Holy Spirit to them who would be their helper. That word is so very important. So if you have your notes, here's what I wrote. You're probably already ahead of me. The Holy Spirit is your helper. And then Jesus actually goes just a little bit further because because he says something to them that, that, that I'm sure was a little difficult for them to grasp. But he says, I'm not going to send somebody to you who you don't know. So, so it's not like I'm sending a stranger to you. It's not like I'm going to introduce this new guy that you've never met before and say, okay, here's your new helper. That's not what he says. He says, but I'm going to send you someone that you already know. That's what he said in the passage. So, so how, how did he know them? Well, verse 17, he says this. He says, in verse 17, once again, he says, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. And then he makes two statements about the Holy Spirit. He says, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And the way he says that, it's so very interesting. He actually uses present tense and future tense. So he sits back and he says, this, this helper that I'm, interest, that, that, that I'm introducing to you presently at this moment dwells in you and not only does he dwell in you right now but he says he will be with you now now, once again the holy spirit uh, or the disciples i think all right maybe we'll get to heaven and they'll sit down and have a conversation with me and tell me that i'm wrong but but i think that they were just getting to know him as well And I think there was a little bit of ambiguity on their part as to, okay, so the Holy Spirit's with us. How is he with us? I think there was a little bit of, because it wasn't like they sat back and said, oh, yeah, we know the Holy Spirit. We've got a conversation with him all the time. I think there was just a little bit of maybe confusion on their part trying to figure out who he was. But, but here's what I want us to catch, and we'll flesh it out just a little bit more. 
So when Jesus defines the Holy Spirit, he could have defined him in a lot of different ways. He could have used so many different titles for him. But here's the way he introduces him to the disciples. He said, this is your helper. Isn't it, so, so whenever you introduce somebody to the very first time, lots of times you always say the very best thing of, of, that you know about them, right? Hey, um, hey Ron, this is Rome. Rome's a great guy. He's the chairman of our deacons. And, and, and Sandy, this is, and, and we always say something about them who's gonna help, uh, that, that, that's going to help us really understand who they are. So here's what Jesus said. Here's the first thing that he wants us to know about the Holy Spirit. He is your helper. So, so you guys are smart. Let's, let's take it back a notch. So if he's our helper, what does that mean? We need help. That's exactly what that means. That's exactly what that means. So, 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 he, so he doesn't look at you and say, this is your sidekick that you're going to need every now and then. He defines him as our helper, which demonstrates the fact that we need his help. Oh, man, would you just pause for a second and allow that truth to sink in to your mind and your heart? As a matter of fact, would you just bow your head for a second? Bow your head for a second and, and, and speak to the Holy Spirit in just a second and say, Holy Spirit, I need your help. I'm dependent upon you. I need your help. You see, I'm convinced that we often don't view him that way. We don't view him as the helper sent to us in Jesus' place. And so as the divine helper, I got, I got to go quick. So as the divine helper sent from God the Father and God the Son, how does he help us. So, so jump with me. Let's go ahead to verses 25 and, and verses 26 of this same chapter. And I wish we had time to just a word by word walk through all of this, but you can do this. Notice verse 25. So Jesus is continuing with this. And he says this, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the helper, once again, same word, parakletos, same word, but the helper the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name. Notice the way. So here's Jesus saying how he's going to help us. How will he help us? He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. So there's a great indication right there of how the Holy Spirit helps us. Let me just give them to you real quick. The first is this. He will teach you. He will teach us all things. What an incredible promise. The Holy Spirit is the great teacher. We don't have time, but when you get back tonight, there's nothing on TV, so when you get home tonight, read First, first Corinthians chapter 2. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm walking through First Corinthians in my, in my devotion time, and First Corinthians chapter 2 is just a, a great chapter that talks about our need for the Holy Spirit. And the fact that it's the Holy Spirit who shows us the mind of God. As a matter of fact, I might have put, oh, uh, I do have a couple of verses here. So 1 Corinthians 2, verses 11 and 12. Here's what Paul says. So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we haven't received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God. Why? so that we might understand the things freely given to us by God. So basically, here's what Jesus is telling the disciples. I've said a lot of things that you probably don't understand yet, but I'm sending the Holy Spirit of God who is going to teach you all things. So the job of the Holy Spirit of God is he is our great teacher. Let me show you a second thing, and it's right here in verse 25. The second thing is this. He looked at the disciples, and he said, he will remind you what Jesus said. 
that when we talk about we talk about the inspiration of Scripture, and actually when we talk about uh, what we call the four gospel or the three gospels, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Did you ever wonder how those guys, years after Jesus left, were able to recall with such precision and detail everything that happened in Jesus's life? And not only that, but that they don't contradict each other. How is it that they were able to recall all of those events with such precision and detail? It's because Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will remind you about everything that I said and everything that that I did. That's one reason why the Gospels are so detailed. And there's so much agreement between the writers. The Holy Spirit helped them remember everything that Jesus said to them. So here's the cool thing. Not only did the Holy Spirit help them recall what Jesus said, but guess what he does to us? He helps us recall what Jesus said. So can I get an amen with that? So, so is anybody like me that the older you get, you're having a hard time remembering all right. So the things you used to be able to remember, you don't remember anymore, right? You can't even remember whether that's the way you are, right? And so, yeah, the older we get, the tougher we get, the tougher we get. But 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 Jesus says that one of the jobs of the helper is to remind us everything that Jesus said. And I would say this, so there's a, a great tie-in with that. The Holy Spirit's teaching agrees with the teaching of Jesus. So they will never contradict each other. I say that, so so, 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 so let me say one little thing, and, and then I'm going to move on. And if you want to talk to me about it afterward or later, you can. I, I'm not a big fan of TV preachers, all right? I'm not. And uh, lots of times, because lots of times you will hear things said that contradict what God's Word says. And at times, they will attribute that Ah, the Holy Spirit told me to say this. The Holy Spirit of God will never, never contradict Jesus. And he will never contradict the Word of God. When somebody might sit back and say, yeah, but I don't know, but somebody told me that. Well, it wasn't the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will not. His job is to what? Is to teach us what Jesus said and to remind us of everything that Jesus said. Yeah. Yeah. And he does, and we're going to talk about that. So let's jump back. Jump with me to John chapter 16. Because in John chapter 16, Jesus continues with with the job of the Holy Spirit. So John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11. So once again, he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit actually begins in verse uh, 4 before that. But in verse 8, it says, And when he comes, talking about when the Holy Spirit comes, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because that I go to the Father, and you will see me no longer. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So, 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 so he does three things. Let me show you three things in this. The first, and I reworded them just a little bit so they're easier for us. The first is this. He will convict, all right? He will convict. The word convict there has the idea of convincing. It is only through the convincing and convicting work of the Holy Spirit that a person is able to see two things. The first, and I don't know if I have these in your notes, the first is they're able to see the wrongdoing and the guilt of sin. All right, so in our fallen condition, we fail to see the wrongness of our own sin. This is a different branch of theology, but in soteriology, in the doctrine of soteriology or salvation, we talk about the fact that we are depraved. 
And because we are depraved, man is depraved. He doesn't see his own wickedness. She doesn't see her own wickedness. It's easy for us to see everybody else's wickedness. I mean, I could alliterate all of Rome's faults for you if we had time tonight. We don't. It's easy for us to see the faults of others, but it's very difficult for us to see our own faults. So what's the job of the Holy Spirit? To convict us of our wrongdoing. Without the Holy Spirit's help, we're oblivious to our own failure. And he also convicts of the need for righteousness. It is only when we realize our own depravity and we reach out in faith for the righteousness of Jesus Christ. So he says, here's the job of the Holy Spirit. He will convict the world of what? Of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So, so it's like, remember the uh, publican in Luke chapter 18 when Jesus was talking about there was the righteous man and the publican and the publican said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. It's the Holy Spirit of God who helps us to do that. So let me pause here for a second because I heard a statement. So, so, so we're looking at, at starting a great evangelistic program here in the future called Alpha. And all of our pastors, we were at this training not long ago, and, and, and the guy said something so simple yet so profound. Because we view evangelism as our responsibility to, convict, to, to convince someone that they need Jesus, right? So I've got to convince this person. And, 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 and the speaker reminded us that it is the Holy Spirit of God who is the great evangelist. He's the evangelist. We're only his helpers. Nobody comes to God unless they are drawn by the Holy Spirit of God. He is the convictor. He is the convincer. He convinces people of their sin. And he convinces people of their need of Jesus. It doesn't matter how eloquent you and I are. It doesn't matter how well we can talk about the gospel. And we need to talk about the gospel. But it doesn't matter how well we present it or anything. It's the Holy Spirit of God who does the work in the hearts and lives of people. Amen? So, So that ought to be an encouragement to us because lots of times we don't witness because we're scared to. We don't think we know the right words. We don't think we know how to say it. Our words aren't going to be convincing. And here's what Jesus is saying. We don't have to be convincing. It's not our job. It's the job of the Holy Spirit of God. He is the great evangelist. He convicts and he draws people to Jesus. He, um, he shows us the need of Jesus' righteousness and then And then he shows also the authority of Jesus as the judge of all the earth. So he will convict of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So so we sit back and see people today who aren't fearful of God at all. They don't believe in God. They don't believe that one day they're going to stand before God. They're, 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 They're rebellious towards that. And if you're like me, I I hear people like that and just like, you know, you know, the blood begins to boil and I start getting upset and I want to stand up and I want to defend the authority of Jesus. Well, at the end of the day, I don't have to defend the authority of Jesus. That's the job of the Holy Spirit of God. He convinces of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. So so here's the first thing that I want us to see, and I'm going quick. So the Holy Spirit is your helper. So that de- the, that shows we got to be desperate for him. We have to realize our need of help. Here's the second thing, and this is Rome's point. He, the Holy Spirit, is your friend. He's your friend. This is something I didn't know about for years. I never viewed the Holy Spirit as my friend. He's my friend. I, I know Jesus is my friend. But I never viewed the Holy Spirit as my friend. And so because the Holy Spirit is a real, distinct person, we're talking about the person of the Holy Spirit, because he's a real, distinct person and not an impersonal force, it is possible for us to enjoy a friendship with him. Can I use Paul's words? 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 14. Paul says this, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ... The love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with y'all. 
Isn't that cool how he defines? So that's kind of like the Old Testament Trinitarian blessing that's found in the book of Numbers. So Paul gives us this New Testament Trinitarian blessing. And he says, I want God to bless you. So here's what I want you to experience. The, the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father. And he could have said anything. He could have said the power of the Holy Spirit. He could have said the comfort of the Holy Spirit. He could have said anything. But here's what he said. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit. So, so what does fellowship entail? For us, it entails food, right? So, so I know that, right? But, but fellowship entails what? It, it entails a relationship. I mean, you invite some over to your house for fellowship. You, you, you want to what? You want to have a relationship with them. And so when Paul uses the Trinitarian blessing on the Corinthians, he says, listen, here's what I want you to experience. I want you to experience fellowship, intimate, real fellowship with the Holy Spirit of God. This verse shows that we can have that. So let me just flesh that out in a few minutes, and if we have time for a few questions, we'll do it. So, So because he's a person, and because we can have a relationship with him and fellowship with him, it also means that we can grieve him or we can quench him. So Paul says in Ephesians 4.30, and don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So here's the idea. Just as you and I can grieve a friend, has a friend ever grieved you? Of course. A friend's hurt our feelings. They've said something about us that, that we didn't like or something about uh, somebody who, who, who we care about and they grieved us. Well, the Holy Spirit is a person who can be grieved. He's not just a force. He's a person whom we can grieve. You might sit back and say, Brian, how do we grieve him? Well, there's a lot of ways we grieve We grieve. I think I grieved him for years by not recognizing him. I tell the story all the time that in Mexico they taught us that whenever you walk in a room, you have to greet every single person. So you walk in, and so you say, hello, Ron, hello, yeah, and, and, and all the way, hello, Ron, hello, hello, everybody. You, you, you know, and so when you leave, you got to do the exact same thing. Why? Because you want to recognize the personhood of everybody. So if I greet three people, but I don't greet this person over here, the other person is going to sit back and think, what, what am I? You know, you, 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 the wall, you don't even recognize my presence? Well, I, I'm afraid for years I grieved the Holy Spirit, but by not recognizing his presence in my life. So, 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 this, so this is new and fresh for me. So if I sound excited, this is new and fresh for me. Some of you are probably more mature than me and you've experienced this for years. So I have it. So, so, so here's my prayer time in the morning. I wake up really early in the morning, grab myself a cup of coffee. I go in my room, this room all by myself, and I grab my Bible. And one of the very first things I do is I say this. I say, good morning, God the Father. Thank you for your love and your care, your undeserving love for me. Good morning, Jesus. Thank you for your grace in my life, dying for me, giving me what I could have never deserved. Good morning, Holy Spirit of God. I recognize you are here with me right now. And and that... You said, Brian, why are you emotional? Because I didn't do that for years. And I feel like I grieve the Holy Spirit of God by not recognizing his presence in my life. We can grieve him. Here, here's the second thing that I want you to see. And, and once again, so this might, be, this might be basic to some and new to others, but you can pray to him. Because the Holy Spirit is a person and your friend, you can pray to him. I was always taught, so here's the way I taught, and I believe there's still some truth to this. I was taught that you pray to God the Father through Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the way I was always taught. But I was always taught that my prayer should be directed to God the Father and not necessarily to the Holy Spirit. So, so I went through long periods where, where, where I didn't speak to him. And yet we find in Scripture that the role of the Holy Spirit is to assist us in expressing ourselves adequately to the Father. Just as Jesus intercedes for us as our high priest, so the Holy Spirit intercedes for us in prayer. Here's a couple of verses. Jude 20. Jude 120 is only one chapter in Jude. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith, Jude says this, 
and praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, now, there's a lot of talk about what praying in the Holy Spirit means. So let's talk about what Jude is talking about. So the book of Jude, or the letter of Jude, was written to combat what? Does anybody know? False doctrine. So, so Jude writes his letter because their false doctrine abounds in the church. And read, there's like 30 verses in Jude, and he's talking about contending for the faith. He almost uses these military terms, fighting for the faith, fighting for what you believe, holding on to pure doctrine. And so in the midst of all of that, he says what? Praying in the Holy Spirit. So Jude calls the church to pray in the Spirit in in the context of holding on to that which is true and holding on to sound doctrine. So let me give you just a couple of things, and I'll be done. Our time is up, and we'll move on. So what does it mean to pray in in the Holy Spirit? So I would say this. It means this. Pray under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In other words, as you pray, you need to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's direction. And this this is so powerful when you think about this. So here's what it means. So as I'm praying... I realize that the Holy Spirit of God is present with me. And as I'm praying, he will bring to remembrance things in my life. So as I'm praying, what are the sins in my life that the Holy Spirit reminds me of? If you sit back and say, well, that never remind me of any sins. Well, it means one or two things. It means either you're not sinning, (laughs) which probably is not the case, or you're not listening to him. All right. So, so what are the sins as I'm praying that the Holy Spirit reminds me of? What are the scriptures that he puts on my heart? Because his job is to bring God's word alive in my mind and heart. Who are the people he puts on my heart? So, 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 so even this morning, this is fresh. So I'm praying this morning, and, and God often, he always brings people to my mind. And so I actually pause and pray for those people, and I'm guilty because I want them to know I pray for them. So I actually stop praying and send a text and say, hey, Ron, I want you to know the Holy Spirit just put you on my heart, and I just prayed for you. Maybe I shouldn't do that. I don't know whether I should or not, but because I stopped my praying to do that. But, but the idea is this, pray under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Pray under the assistance of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So you ever find yourself and you sit back and you think, I don't know how to pray for this situation. I know what I, how I want to pray, but I don't know how I should really pray for this situation. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. So I would encourage you at that moment to just sit in silence. That's tough for us to do, is it not? Sit in silence. Remember that that prayer is a conversation, all right? It's not a soliloquy, all right? It's not just you standing up stout, saying everything that you want. Prayer is a conversation. And lots of times we speak, but we don't ever Allow God to speak back to us so we don't ever listen. So sit in silence. Give the Holy Spirit of God time to speak to you and give the Holy Spirit of God time to speak through you. And the last is this. Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. You say, Brian, what does that mean? Okay, here's my transparent confession, okay? I'm still learning what that means. (laughs) I wish I could stand up and say, hey, let me hear, hear the profoundness of what it means. I'm still learning what it means. Here's what I believe, though. I believe that it involves humility. I believe that it involves dependence. I believe that it involves perseverance. And I believe that it involves faith. So, so as I'm praying, I humble myself before the Holy Spirit of God. I recognize my dependence upon him. I persevere. So, so, so and uh, my time's up, I know, so, so, so I'm done. But, but, but here's one of, and I think we talked about this in our sanctification class. If any of us were in the sanctification class, 
I think sometimes we're so rushed that, that our conversations with God and with the Holy Spirit are, okay, I have like three minutes, Lord, and so let me just tell you real quick what's on my heart, and then we go on. But we don't just sit, and we sit back and wonder, why don't we hear from God? Because we don't give God time to speak to us. He has to speak to us on our agenda and our timetable, and we don't give him time to do that. I believe that power in prayer comes from persevering in prayer and sitting in the presence of the Holy Spirit of God, seeking his direction, realizing that he's, by the way, Romans chapter 8, he's taking our prayers and he's interceding to God on our behalf because sometimes he realizes our frailty. And so Brian's praying, God, you know, please do this for me and please do this for me. And the Holy Spirit takes Brian's prayers and goes to God and said, or God the Father and says, okay, let me tell you what Brian really means. <laughs> Not that God doesn't understand it, but he, but, but he intercedes for us. And Paul says with groanings that can't be uttered, he just, he just goes to God on our behalf. So, so here's my point tonight before we dive into this the next three weeks. It is amazing. We have an amazing privilege to have the Holy Spirit of God living within us, with us. He dwells with you. He will be with you. Allow him to be a trusted friend to you. Don't be afraid to reach out to him, to communicate with him, to listen to him, and to depend on him. That's all I got tonight. That's all I got. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, it would be it would be completely dishonest of us to say that we completely understand you, to understand how you completely work in our lives and what it means for us to be dependent upon you. But tonight we pause and we thank you for the fact that you are our helper. You're our comforter, our counselor, our advocate. Thank you that that the God the Father and God the Son sent you to us so that you might help us. And we recognize our need of your help tonight. We confess the fact that we haven't sought you as we should. We confess our independence of you. And we cry out to you tonight, telling you that we desperately need you in our lives. Thank you, though, that you're not just our helper. You're a friend. You're a friend who's with us to comfort us, to guide us, to direct us, to empower us. And Father, we pray, Lord, in our lives and in our ministries, we pray for the power of the Holy Spirit of God. I pray that you would do a work in our lives. Lord, not only do you draw us to Jesus, but it is the work of the Holy Spirit of God who sanctifies us, who reminds us of our sin, who encourages us and strengthens us. And we ask that you would do that work in our lives. Help us to get to know you. As we get to know you, I pray that you would be real in our lives and we would experience your presence and we would experience your power. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.